In Psalm the 8th chapter, <clears throat> David said this <clears throat> in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. When David said, I consider things that you have done. In my mind, it goes back to him just possibly being a shepherd and at night on the hillside in Judea just considering who God is. And I think all of us have those moments in our lives where we think about God. And our thought process is constructed based upon what we know in Scripture. But I must also share with you that I'm not sure that we meditate upon God as often as we should. And to do that, we must know what the Bible tells us that it is that we need to meditate on. And I think Psalm 145 helps us understand that. Come on. Come on. Oh, you're seeing what I'm not seeing. Okay, I'm sorry. Hang on just a second. It's not on up here. My apologies. Act like you didn't see any of that. In Psalm 145, I want to read this passage if I may. This is part of what uh, Doug read for us a little earlier. This is, again, as I said, this is from Psalm 145. And I, as I read this, I want you to just think about, and I, I use that term in a meditative kind of way. I want you to think about what David sees and what David is thinking about as he considers God and who God is. He says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. And then he says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, shall declare your mighty works. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. I want to suggest something to us that I don't want you to misunderstand this morning. The Bible is academic in the sense that there are things that we have to read, that we have to study, and that we have to understand. But sometimes that gets lost in the fact that we should understand God from a perspective that impresses us. Not just with what He said, but impresses us with who He is. And I think sometimes that gets lost in our inability to take the time or our, maybe not inability, that's the poor way to say that, but in our unwillingness to take the time and really stop to consider who God is. I think that's what David is trying to help us do and others do as he and others in Israel would sing this particular psalm and as they would consider who God is. Let me ask you a question this morning that relates to this specifically as we think about our worship today. I ask this question. Why are you here today? And I ask that legitimately. I want you to think about why you're here. You may say, well, I'm here because it's Sunday. And if, 
If that's the extent of why you're here, that's a very shallow and poor answer. I realize that you're here because it is Sunday, but that's not fundamentally and that's not the foundation for which you've come this morning. It may be that you're here today because you say, well, I come to worship because I get something out of worship. And I think there is a truth to that. I think there is something that God wants us to get out of worship. We all understand that we're not here to give God something that He needs. He doesn't need us. Whatever we're giving Him, we're giving Him because it's what we need. And that is fundamentally something we must understand. Folks, if every single one, one of us passed from this life in the next second or two, God would still be God. And it wouldn't phase God a bit in the sense of it wouldn't change who God is. And if, if all His creatures were to pass from this life, it would not change who God is. There is something about worship that ought to help us understand something about who God is and appreciate who God is. The thrust of our worship is not what we get out of it just purely from that standpoint. Even though I understand that in Hebrews 10... The Hebrew writer says that we are to consider one another and how to stir up one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together like some are doing, but considering one another and exhorting one another so much the more and as such as we see the day of God approaching. I understand all of that and that is an advantage and that's something that I do look forward to. But the thrust of our worship is to honor a God who is worth worshiping. I want you to think about that. I, I, it is a benefit to us to do it, to, to worship Him that way because when we worship and when we understand who God is and our worship is heartfelt and given Him as a result of that, He doesn't need us to understand that. He needs us to understand that we need to understand that. And when we're honoring that kind of worship, we are fulfilling this very idea of worship. The, the, the old English word for worship is worship. In other words, we are, we are honoring somebody who is worth honoring. And we do that because we have considered Him and we have meditated upon Him and we have thought about Him. That's why I think it's so unfair to God and to ourselves when we come into a worship period, anytime we come to worship, and we've not considered who He is. As a child, I used to always wonder, why, why is it that my dad goes through the house every Sunday morning singing hymns at the top of his lungs? And as I got older, it dawned on me, he is, he is preparing himself. The kids didn't particularly care for it. But I think what he was doing was he was preparing himself in his way to come before God as he was going to do like we're doing this morning. And all of us, I think, prepare in different kind of ways. But I think there is a preparation that we ought, ought to consider, just like I think David is considering in Psalm 45. And I think these are the ideas, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to call them great, good, and gracious. I think those ideas are presented here, and I want you to think about it particularly as it relates to this. The greatness of God's power the goodness of his character and the graciousness of his disposition. So his power, his character, and his disposition, I think, are seen not only in Psalm 145, but really throughout Scripture. And I want to I talk to you for a moment this morning about each one of those. Now think about this. God is, God is great. God's not great like I saw a great movie. That's not how God's great. God is not great like, well, I had a great time last night. Thanks for inviting me. God's not great like that. Or we had a great dinner, like many of us have already said, and many of us will continue to say over the next several days. That's not how God is great. God is great in, in Psalm 145. Just think about this. You may want to follow along in your Bible. Psalm 145, verse 4 talks about His mighty acts. Verse 6 talk about His awesome acts and His greatness. Verse 11 talk about His glory and His power. Verse 12 talk about His majesty. All these words attest to God's greatness. 
And I want you to think about it. These were things that David knew. I want you to think about that. Though all these things that attest to his greatness, these were things that David knew. That these were not things that David manufactured to, to talk to his family about. You know, he, he didn't say, let me think of a good story that makes God bigger than life and I'm going to tell them that story and then they're going to be impressed with God and that ought to last for a while. He wasn't that way at all. He was saying, I want to tell you something about God that shows his greatness and I'm not having to manufacture this. David said, I know this. I know these things. And now, so that's why in verse 10, I think he says, all your works praise you. May I suggest in a culture that, that is so impressed, and I realize that it's fantasy, and most would realize it, but, but isn't our culture impressed with superheroism? It's always been that way. We, we are impressed with those who can, can carry themselves above nature and, and superimpose themselves in a realm where nobody else is and who can do things that nobody else can do. That's, that's what we like. And David said, I don't have to create it. It's eternal. David said, all your works praise you. Don't you think about it. The, the, the things that we see in nature and the things that we see around about us speak and, stay, and, and, and shout God. And I think what David says is when you come to worship, you need to be able to see all the things, these mighty acts these awesome acts, the greatness of God, the glory and the power and the majesty. You need to be able to see that. And may I just say this in passing? If we haven't put our minds to that, if we just come in and say, well, my period of time to worship God is this hour or two slot. If that's all we're about, I don't think we see it like David saw it. And I don't think we see it like, like God intends for us to see it. It's something that he considered, he thought about, he meditated upon. That's what the Psalms are. And so as Israel sang these songs, they were, they were songs that had to do with seeing the greatness of who God is. And sometimes it gets lost in the fact that we're so involved in this life and things that are on this earth and things that affect us on a day-to-day, -day, on an hour-to-hour, -hour, and on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, we don't stop and think about the greatness of God. So I want like for Kenneth to come and just lead one verse of a song that we're very familiar with. But as he leads this song, I want you to think particularly about the verse that we're going to sing. And think about the fact that there is none like him. None can compare. Kenneth? Think about praising and honoring the God of heaven. David was the lead songwriter, I think, and also the lead song leader, possibly, in Israel. And so in Psalm 33 and verse 3, you may want to just jot these down. I'm not going to read them all. Psalm 33, 3, Psalm 96, 1, Psalm 98, 1, Psalm 144, 9, Psalm 149, 1. All of these verses say this, and I want you to think about this. Sing to the Lord a new song. You ever thought about that? Do, do you think that what, that what David is saying is, listen, we, we've, been singing these, we've been singing these same old songs a long time. 
Would somebody write another song? Would somebody write a new song? We all like, well, I won't say we all like, but a lot of people like to sing new songs. Is that what David said? In these psalms that I mentioned, is he saying we need to sing to the Lord a new song because these other songs now, that we just worn them out. You ever thought about a new song and what a new song means? God had done something new in their midst. This is interesting to me. In the time of David, and in the time when, when, when in physical Israel, God was performing things for them which they saw, which we don't see. But they were seeing things, they were seeing these miraculous powers, these supernatural powers manifest in ways that we don't see today. I'm not suggesting that God isn't working, but God doesn't work today like He worked then. That was obvious. He was providing those things to help them and ultimately us believe in who He was. But God was doing something new in their midst and because their songs did not adequately express what He had done, they sang new songs. They wrote new songs. They expressed to God things that, that they had to sing about. And they did that because what they had, had previously said and what they had previously thought was not serving the purpose. And so he says, let us sing a new song. Let us express to God in a new kind of way about something which He has done that we maybe have not seen before or maybe not thought about as we should. What new thing God has done. And I think this newness has to do with the fact that only God is worthy to do these kind of things. And so when you think about the new things that God has done, it helps you understand that He alone is worthy to have this kind of praise. I want you to listen to this. This is, uh, this is from Revelation 5. I want you to listen. You may want to turn there. I'm reading the first several verses. You may want to turn, but if not, just listen to this. And this is what John said as he, as he envisioned, as he, he was really given the ability to see what God wanted him to see. He said, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one under heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. Because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Can, can, you see, can you see John in this vision? He's seeing all this happen and the scroll, the scroll is there in heaven and there's nobody that's, that's able and that's worthy enough to open the scroll. And John's seeing all this, seeing all this develop and then all of a sudden it stops because there's nobody there worthy to open this. And he weeps. Think about that. He, he's been given the opportunity to see all this and, and basically the story as it unfolds, the story stops because there's nobody there who can do what needs to be done. And verse 5 says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. There's hope. And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures... And the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll 
and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. We need to be impressed with who not only God is, but we need to be impressed with the greatness of His Son. We continue to be impressed with God working for us. That's what, that's what John was impressed with, what God had done. He, and His Son had, had come and he, because He was the Lamb. He was worthy of opening the seal. And our recognition and love for Him grows so that we find a new... Think about this. We, 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 don't, we may not be developing a new song, but we, we develop a new level of trust and we, we uh, develop a new level of appreciation because we see what God does for us and we appreciate what He's done for us. God is truly great and we continue to grow as we see His greatness. And may I just suggest to all of us, again, may I say that we need to just stop and be impressed with what He's done. He is great. He is great in a unique and powerfully strong way. And then it says that he's good. Go back again, sorry. It says he's good. And, and just think about this. If he is, if God is great and now he's saying he's good, does, does that not seem like a step down to you? Well, you know, God is great and he's good. It almost seems like we, we've demoted him in some way. But, but that's not the case at all. Because how David uses a word is not that great trumps good. It's not that at all. He's saying something different about God. He's saying that God's goodness speaks not to his power, but it speaks to his character. In that he is kind and he is compassionate to all. We could talk about this, I think, but I think it's going to be better if we sing about it. Let's think about this. Think about the character of God and how He has affected your life with the two songs that we're about to sing. We're going to sing, God is so good. And then Kenneth's going to lead us in two verses of the song, I sing the mighty power of God. And when we sing those two verses, I want you to notice the contrast between the first verse and the second verse. Saying the things that we've discussed thus far in this lesson. Now think about how that affects you this morning. Kenna? Number 47, God is so Oh, I'm 
Finally, this morning, I want you to consider the fact that God is gracious. And some of these things, in some of these, there may be overlap, but I want you to, to think about this this morning. Turn, turn in your Bible to Psalm 145. I want to look at a few verses toward the end of the chapter that we have not previously read. The graciousness of God has to do with His disposition. And it has to do with His temperament. In Psalm 145 and verse 17, David says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways, gracious in all His works. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love Him. But all the wicked He will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless His holy name forever and ever. If you go back up to 145 in verse 8, it says the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The statement that is read earlier in, or later in this chapter in Psalm 145 is really spoken from Exodus 34 and verse 6. It's almost a statement that is really given out verbatim. It says the Lord is righteous in all His ways and gracious in all His works. Exodus 34 and 6 is spoken after the, the story of the golden calf. You remember that? When the children of Israel made the golden calf and, and they come and, 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 and they remembered that God had brought them out of Israel. He had done great things before them. He had shown His goodness to them by providing for them for their physical needs. And what is it that the Israelites do to say thank you for His greatness and goodness? They say, well, Moses hadn't been back for 40 days. So let's collect and let's, let's build something so that we can, we can honor God by building something that He does not want us to do. And what I want you to notice about that is that it's after that that God tells them what kind of gracious God He is. Even after they had done those things, God could have wiped them out, but He was gracious toward them. Listen, if you would, from Exodus 34. I'm reading this after this issue with the golden calf. Here's what God said beginning in verse 6 of Exodus 34. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. You know what Moses is doing? You know what God's wanting Moses to go do? They've built, a, they've built this calf, and, and Moses, or God tells Moses, you go tell them who I am. You go tell them that, that I can, it maybe is that I ought to wipe you out, but that's not who I am. I am gracious and I am merciful and I am forgiving. And I love this context because he says all those things. He says, I am long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And listen to this, and by no means clearing the guilty. But what is impressive to me is, is that because they had sinned, he could have quickly wiped them out. But time and time again, he's gracious. How long would you live if every time you sinned, God destroyed you? How long, how long would you last if every time you did something that adversely affected God. How long would you live? How long would any of us live if that's the way God treated us? We'd all be dead. None of us would be here. No one would be here. 
but because He's gracious toward us. He saves us. He saved us, those of us who should be condemned because we're sinners. And, and shouldn't that alone serve to help us honor Him the way He needs to be honored? You know, we, we, we do assemble, as, as Shane reminded us this morning, we assemble every Lord's Day and we remember the death of Jesus. And, and, and the reason that it seems to me that that's central, first of all, is because that's what God wants. He wants us to remember Him, but, but we remember Him because it shows His graciousness to us. I talk a lot about the long-suffering of God. And I think about it a lot because it's, the, it's that long-suffering that keeps me going. It's the long-suffering that keeps me saying, even though with all my weaknesses and with all my problems and with all my sins, God still loves me. He still cares about me. And that alone should move us to worship. Now let me make one final practical observation. Don't you think that based upon the fact that He is so great, and He's uniquely powerful. We're not here this morning serving one of a multiplicity of gods. We're not here this morning picking one and choosing one out of many and saying, well, today we're going to honor this one. We're not doing that. We're not the Egyptians who had multiple gods and they worship different gods on different occasions for different reasons. That's not why we're here this morning. We're here to worship the one true God. The one true God who is uniquely powerful. We're here to worship the one true God which, who is uniquely good. He is the only one who can provide for us as He does. Can, I want you to think about this. The, the physical day-to-day -day blessings that we enjoy, the food, as we say, the food, clothing, and the shelter, do you know why we have those things? We have those because God's provided them. If God didn't want us to have those, if God didn't want us to have any food, we wouldn't have any food. If He didn't want us to have any shelter, we wouldn't have any shelter. If He wanted to wipe out every shelter we have, He could do it immediately. If He wanted to wipe out every crop, every source of food that we have, He could do it immediately. And if He wanted to send us to hell because He's sovereign, He could. Now, having, having just thought about all those things, again, practically for just a moment, what should that do for us? What, let, let's, let's just think about this assembly. Can we not give and should we not want to give and do, do we not have an obligation when we are assembled together to come in and give Him our very best in our thought process to Him who has done all these things for us? And ought we not be ashamed because we may sit in an assembly and think, man, I am hungry. What? Or, or, or sit in an assembly and be distracted by various things that can distract us and, 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 and let, that, let that something so small intimidate us into, into taking our minds off the very reason why we're here. And I would say to us, do we really want to do that? Are we really that small spiritually to say, I'm going to, I'm going to let my mind be distracted and taken away from the very thing that I'm here to do? And, and I have, I, I, I'm talking to myself too. There are distractions. And, and, and am I really going to take an, 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 an electric device that has, that has now taken over my life, can I not set it aside for an hour or two on the Lord's Day and give Him my full attention without having to check scores and whether or not a restaurant's open early? Please. Please. Do we not see who He is and what He's done? Nothing, my friends, nothing should distract us. And I know that there are things in our lives that come between us and our worship to God. It is difficult when, when things are, are going on in one's life. It's difficult to come into assembly and put that away. I understand that. 
And believe me, there are times when I struggle in an assembly because of certain events or certain things or certain situations or whatever are going on in my life. It may be personal, may relate to my family, may relate to other things in my life. And I understand that that's difficult. But compared to who we're worshiping, that ought to take a back seat. And I know that's hard. But if I understand the greatness, the goodness, and the graciousness of God, it'll change who I am. And it'll change how I view Him. And it'll change how I worship Him. He is worthy. He is worthy. Kenneth's going to lead a verse of worthy of praise. And I'd like for you to consider that as he leads us in that song at this time. thank these guys in the back that have made some adjustments in helping me this morning with these slides and I very much appreciate that. I want to close this morning by thinking about the verse that we're about to sing to encourage anyone who would need to respond to the gospel. I want you to think about this verse, especially as it relates to who God is and how He cares for us and how good He's been to us. And when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. If we will consider who He is, it seems to me that we would always respond to Him in the way that He wants. And one of the ways is to recognize our need for salvation and to take full advantage of what He's done for us, which is the ultimate gift in that He has sent His Son to die for us. I hope the song and the verse of the song that I have just read that we're about to sing would move you not just in some momentary way. What would move you to say, I need to change my life. I need to have God forgive me of my sins and I need to become one of His. The only way you can have your sins forgiven, the only way is to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And the only way that happens is to allow the waters of baptism in a spiritual way, take those sins away. It's not going to get rid of the dirt that's on your body, but it's going to get rid of the filth that's on you spiritually. And when a person is baptized into Christ, his sins are taken away. And he can take advantage of every spiritual blessing that's found in Christ. If you need to respond this morning to the gospel of Jesus Christ, take advantage of all the good things that God has done for you by coming forward as we stand and as we sing. Amen.